I'm Nate Leonard. Some of you may know me. I am an assistant professor of English, uh, and it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Dave Collins and Mr. Vic Holmes. Um, their talk, Should We or Shouldn't We, Rising to Activism, uh, is largely based on Mark Ferris and Vic Holmes' struggle for marriage equality in the state of Texas. Um, a couple of things. First of all, there's going to be a book signing after this talk where Dave and Vic will be out in the lobby signing books. Please feel free to stick around, talk to them, sign, get them to sign something for you. Uh, it should be an excellent opportunity to kind of pal around, that kind of stuff. Okay? Um, it's, really, it's a really odd honor, but a great honor, for me to introduce Dave Collins. I was hired to replace Dave Collins. So it's sort of a strange feeling to be up here as somebody who's in my fifth year at Westminster introducing someone who spent over 40 years here. Uh, Dave has published on a wide variety of subjects, both scholarly and creative nonfiction. In fact, a section from Accident Accidental Activists, the book that this talk is based on, basically, sort of, um, uh, won the, let me see if I can get it this right, the Mayborn Literary Nonfiction Conference first place prize. Um, Dave had a long and legendary career here at Westminster teaching Shakespeare, film, and creative nonfiction, and he is one of the sort of titans, from what I can tell, of the kind of history of the Westminster faculty. It was while Dave was here at Westminster that he met Mark Ferris, who was a student at the time, and his, his interactions with Mark are what led to the writing of this book. Mark Ferris and his husband, Vic Holmes, who was with us. Mark, unfortunately, couldn't make it because of professional obligations, uh, are here to speak about their pro the process they went through to uh, fight for equal rights on the marriage front in Texas uh, over the last couple of years. Vic, let me get my notes here, uh, served for 23 years in the United States Air Force, retired as a major in 2010, and he is currently an assistant professor of physician, physician assistant studies and a clinician at the University of North Texas Health Center, uh, Health Science Center in Fort Worth, Texas. Dave, on the other hand, is living in the great comforts of retirement in North Carolina. So please join me in uh, welcoming our two speakers today, Dr. Dave Collins and Mr. Vic Holmes. Thank you, Nate, for that uh, generous introduction. And thank all of you uh, for coming to share this uh, time with us this morning. Uh, as Nate mentioned, I used to teach here. And although I retired a few years ago, I still think I know Westminster College well. And I still think I know what it means to be a student here. Um, remember what that admissions counselor told you when he or she was recruit recruiting you to come to Westminster? Uh, all that stuff about close faculty-student relations, about forming friendships with faculty members that would last a lifetime. A lot of colleges put it out there. Um, the good news is that at Westminster it's actually true. And that's how Accidental Activists, my book about Mark Farris and Vic Holmes, got started. I was walking on a hot, sweaty afternoon in the fall of 1978 to my first class of the semester. Uh, I was thinking about a lot of things. Uh, I was thinking, could I convert just a few of the students in that class to my love of Shakespeare? Could I make the world safe for the Oxford comma? Um, but I was thinking about other things as well. I always read the role and memorized the names of the students in my class before I went to class. And I tried to use that first class to associate names with faces. And so when I walked into that room, I was looking around to see what I could find. One student stood out, light skin, lots of freckles, a shock of red hair. His name, it would turn out, was Mark Farris. Days later, unhappy with his grade on that first essay, it happens, um, Mark was in my office trying to find out what he could do to do better. 
I quickly discovered that Mark was that student that every professor dreams of. Serious, smart, hardworking, and yet funny. Few too many puns, but generally funny, uh, I guess. Uh, we became teacher-student friends. He forgave me that unsatisfactory grade and enrolled semester after semester in one of my classes, most semesters anyway. He wrote a senior thesis with me on Shakespeare. Of course, in his four years at Westminster, I learned a lot about Mark. I learned about his love for his family, about his life in Oklahoma, about his love for the Boy Scouts, about his ambition for a life in the law. What I didn't learn between 1978 and 1982 is that Mark was gay. That he kept buried very, very deep. A wise move in Missouri in the 1970s. Probably a wise move at Westminster College in the 1970s. Looking back, I realize that if, even if Mark had confided in me, or if I had somehow discovered that he was gay, I would have had no idea of the pain that caused him in a decidedly homophobic America. That would come later. For 35 years, Mark and I uh, kept in touch. Somewhere along the line, I learned that he was gay, that he had met the love of his life, Vic Holmes, and that despite the difficulties of a long-distance relationship imposed by Vic's 22-plus years in the Air Force, they were blissfully happy together. For a long time, I didn't meet Vic. Uh, that took a special force, and yes, Facebook played a part. And what does it not play a part these days? Toward the end of October in 2013, Mark announced on Facebook that he and Vic had joined with two women, Nicole de Metman uh, and Cleopatra de Leon, and had filed suit against Texas. Mark and Vic wanted what we all want, the right to marry the person we most love in all the world. Nicole and Cleo had married earlier in Massachusetts, and they wanted their marriage recognized by the state of Texas. I sent congratulations, celebrated their courage, watched and listened as they won their first legal victory in a, a federal district court in February of 2014. I grieved with them as the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals in New Orleans delayed and delayed and delayed again in setting a date for oral arguments in their case. We all wondered if it was because Greg Abbott the Attorney General, prosecuting that case, of course, was running for governor. Finally, in the fall of 2014, I detected a change in Mark's presence on Facebook, just that feeling you get from the kind of posts that are going up. Since the district court victory in San Antonio, Mark had posted regularly five or six posts about their travels, nature photos, pictures of their home, pictures of their place at the lake, and maybe one post about the lawsuit. But all of a sudden, as the struggle for marriage equality heated up across the nation, the tenor of Mark's presence on Facebook changed. All of a sudden, it was six or seven posts a day about the lawsuit, and maybe one about something else. And then on November 20th of 2014, the Fifth Circuit at last announced the date for oral arguments in Dillion v. v. Perry, their case. I reached out again, this time a private message on Facebook, offering encouragement again, celebrating their courage, convincing them that they would win, doing what I could to support them long distance. But this time, I added that classic English teacher line. You've heard it. You can probably recite it. I hope you're keeping a journal, I wrote, since this is going to make a great book. Minutes later, Mark replied. Are you busy, he asked. 
Can I call? I had barely sent off my reply when the phone rang. Rang. Mark, of course. And he had only one question. Why don't you write the book? I'll tell you more in just a little while about writing that book, about some of the many elements that, uh, that eventually found their way into it. But first, I'm going to step aside while Vic tells you a little about the history of the lawsuit he and Mark, Cleo and Nicole, filed to claim the rights denied them by statutory and constitutional law in Texas. Hello. So, and everybody can hear it pretty good? We're all good, yep. So, why did we do this? So, when we started this process, the title of this lecture is Should We or Shouldn't We? And that's actually the title in one of the chapters of the book. Um, but that was also a common phrase echoing throughout our house when we were trying to make the decision of would we or would we not be involved in this lawsuit. And to kind of understand where this comes from, these, well, these were us. Th this was our lives before this, before really a lot of things that have happened. I grew up in the project area of Illinois, Southern Illinois and Cairo, which doesn't really exist anymore. Mark grew up in Oklahoma, fairly normal lives, fairly normal families. Everything was fairly normal. Um, I have the picture of my parents up there at their wedding. This was 1977. Um, my parents, so when my mom and dad got married, that was certainly the happiest day of their life, but it was also one of the happiest days of mine because I finally had a father and he was amazing. Um, and he's just passed just this last year, but everything that he and my mom have taught me led us to the point where we are today because they had such an incredible bond with each other. They, they loved each other so much and still do that I wanted that. And I always thought that I would have that until always stopped and always stopped right around age 15 for me when I realized that I was gay. I was a late bloomer. So yeah, Mark was like around age six, so the comparator. But at around age 15, when I started realizing that I was different from the rest of the, the folks around me, I also started realizing that the things that my parents had, I would never have. I would never have the marriage. I would never have the 2.x kids. I would not have the happily ever after, especially the kind that my mom had. Um, when we grew up in the project housing, that was, that was a very bad time. And my mom got us through a lot. And when she and my, my dad got married, to see her so happy with someone else, that, that joy in my heart was just astounding. And then when I turned 15 and realized that I was not going to have that, that, that really hurt. So things progressed. Um, I did grow up fairly normally, uh, with a few exceptions, the, the, the bullying, the, the things that people go through now. Um, when I joined the military, uh, not too much longer after high school, I joined the military um, right before Don't Ask, Don't Tell. So I got to live the whole thing. Um, Don't Ask, Don't Tell started uh, the co a couple of years, 1991, right after I had come in and I'd been established for a bit. I knew that I was gay. I knew that it was bad to be gay in the military and in general, and you just didn't talk about things like that. And what Don't Ask, Don't Tell did for the LGBT community in the military was, was horrible. It was supposed to be something better. It was supposed to be something better than what we had. But it wasn't. Um, it, it, the short version is it gave them a license to go looking for, for gay people. And it gave them a legal license to do it. And that, that was even worse. Before they could just find you and that would be you, but this gave them a license to do witch hunting. So 
a lot of LGBT things went undercover, went underground, and there's, in fact, there's a section in the book that talks about um, a friend of mine who, when, when he was found out, um, we called it tagging, when you were tagged, um, one of your friends would call you and say, Bob, for example, Bob has been tagged. And that was it. You didn't say anything else. And, and the call ends. And then you call your friends and Bob has been tagged. And from that point forward, no one talks to Bob. No one goes near him. No one interacts with him other than at a work and professional level. You essentially, you don't know Bob anymore. Because with the way that things were, if they, f if the investigative agency felt that you were part of Bob's close friend network, then you got to be investigated too. And then your friends got to be investigated too. And the track and trace would just spider web outwards from there. So when someone was tagged, you just, that was the end of it. And it was, it was one of the worst things that I've had to go through, having had that because a friend he called he called and he needed help and he needed somebody and and I couldn't do it so again it was a bad thing and when I retired it was seven days before the uh, repeal of don't ask don't I'm sorry seven days after the repeal of don't ask don't tell was signed it didn't go in the repeal didn't go into effect for a couple of months but at least it was gone by then um, during this time, when I was in the military, I, I worked my butt off. I worked my butt off to do things, to be things, so that people would not, they, it would distract them from the fact that I was gay. I didn't want them to know that, I didn't want them to even suspect. So I, would, I did as much as I could, as well as I could, to try and deflect that. Um, Mark and I met halfway through my military career. So uh, when we met, it was in San Antonio in 1998. Um, this, there she is. This is, uh, for those who don't recognize her, this is Governor Ann Richards. And she was at a fundraiser that we both attended. Mark was the governor for HRC, uh, the Human Rights Campaign in San Antonio. And as the governor for the Human Rights Campaign, he was pretty public. That was a surprise. When I first started dating him, I knew that he was a governor, so that was, that was not a surprise. Um, I didn't think that I could be involved in anything like that. I, in fact, I specifically tried to avoid things like that. Uh, but my computer skills and his people skills, we meshed so naturally to try and make this work that I worked behind the scenes. And when this photograph was taken at a fundraiser, a friend of mine at the office saw it. I had several of them printed out, but um, they were going through my stuff and found it. And they said, oh, oh, is that your grandmother? Is that your brother there? And from that point forward, this is the only photograph of Mark that I could keep on my desk. Because every person that saw it, and, and I know who Ann Richards is. I'm apparently the only one. Every person that saw it thought that Mark and I were her grandsons. And so it was safe. Uh, in the meantime, we did a lot of traveling. We went to some interesting places. Um, we, we've been to both poles, so we are bipolar. Uh, we've, been to, <laughs> we've been to Uluru when it was 122 degrees. And that was the shade with the flies. Um, and we've been to the, the other extremes as well. So we, we've been a lot of places and we've done a lot of things together. And part of that is because it wasn't, it wasn't our intention to get married. It was our intention to live our lives together. I, I knew already that I wasn't going to get married. I mean, I, that, when I was 15, I realized that. Mark had no assessment or no aspersions to that either. He'd, he'd pretty much given that dream up as well. Um, marriage equality was not something that was going to happen in our lifetimes simply because it couldn't. There was no way that it could. So we had every intention of living every moment of our lives together. 
And he's so cute. How could you not? Um, no, seriously, he's pretty cute. Hey, where is he at? There he is. I wish he was here right now. So when DOMA was repealed, when the Windsor decision came out, and his friend Frank, and our friend really, Frank called and said, hey, um, we're looking at this from the perspective of now that DOMA is down, we can try to repeal the state ban, at least. We can try to get marriage equality in Texas. Um, what do you think of that? And Mark said, uh, <laughs> I think that's a great idea. Someone should do that. Which is interesting because someone should do that. That happens a lot in medicine. For those of you going into medicine, you'll see that uh, accident occurs. Big accident. Oh, it's horrible. Plate glass window falls on somebody inexplicably. Um, 30 people standing around with their phones. They're all taking pictures, but no one's actually calling 911. So, but that's because someone is going to do it. It's not me, but there, there is someone that's going to do that. And the same thing was true here. Yes, it needs to be done. Something needs to be done about that, and somebody will do it, but yeah, not, not, not us. Um, over the succeeding times, we, we talked about it, and ultimately we decided to do it. But that decision did not come easily. It took about five months, and part of that decision was because of the uniform that I wore. When I retired from the Air Force, I promised myself and the world that I would be myself, that I was tired of hiding, that I would not be the guy in the closet, that Mark was the man that I loved, and that was perfectly okay. Not being in the military anymore, I exercised that freedom, and there were times when just the thought of that was incredibly scary, but from the perspective of this lawsuit, I told him, if you want to do this, then we'll do it. If you don't want to do this, then we won't do it. But there's no penalty either way. There's no negative consequence, because wherever you're going, I'm going with you. And if you want to go this route, I will travel this road with you. If you want to go a different road, we'll get in that car and go down that road. But wherever it is, we're going to go together, and I'm not holding anything against anybody. In my mind, I did want to do this. Scary as it was, I did want to do this. And the reason that I wanted to do it was because of everything I just told you. Everything that I had to live through when I was a teenager, everything that I had to live through in Don't Ask, Don't Tell, no one's kids should have to do that. And if I can stop even one kid from having to live that way, it is certainly worth it. So for me, this decision, I would go either way. For Mark, he was not out at his office. He was a conservative lawyer in a conservative firm. That was very difficult. <laughs> it's difficult to find jobs when no one will hire you, especially in the state of Texas, where it's still legal to fire someone because they're gay. So it was really his choice, ours together, but his in principle, and when he made this decision. He, I was typing, I was, I'm doing a lesson plan for my students. I teach cadaver-based anatomy, and so I'm doing a lesson plan on the ear, and as I'm filling in my PowerPoints at my desk, he's saying, okay, we got to do this. We have to do this. Yes, let's do this. And then later, no, 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 we can't do this. I can't, I, no, this, there's just no way. I can't possibly. But no, we have to, because someone's got to do this. Someone, it's got to, well, it can be us. Scott. And so this continued for about two and a half hours. And I finished my presentation on the ear, and we went to bed. And at around 2.30 in the morning, um, I woke up to, but if we do, <laughs> whispering in the bed next to me. And then the next day, and the next day, and the next day. And this continued for about four or five months. It was up, it was down, it was up, it was down. And it was honestly, it was driving him nuts. Um, I won't say it was driving me nuts because I've been there for years, but it was definitely 
it was wearing on him. And finally, we, we sat down and I said, look, we either do this or we don't, but whatever it is, you, you're working yourself into a state, and I'm going to have to put you on something if you don't knock it off. <laughs> so we went down, we met with the lawyers. When we met with the lawyers, they actually put us more at ease because they told us, hey, don't worry about it. It's okay, because all we need is your name. We're going to file the lawsuit, and if anybody calls, if there's any publicity, if there's reporters or whatever, send them to us. We take care of all of that stuff. We have this media group, we have this unit, we're good to go with that. Just direct them our way. So on that basis, yes. Yeah, we decided, okay, we'll do this. If, if we've got that kind of backing and that kind of backup, we are good to go. And when we filed the lawsuit, within one hour of filing the lawsuit, NPR called Mark's cell phone. I don't know how they got his cell phone number. I'm pretty sure it was not the legal firm. So, no, actually I know it wasn't them, but I don't know how they got it. And he was at the office and he didn't expect the call. He thought it was one of his other business contacts and suddenly he was doing an interview on NPR in his office. And he finished the interview and it made him so physically ill that he had to go home because suddenly he realized oh crap, I'm out. <laughs> and so I came home straight off. Um, when we did this, we were anticipating that the lawsuit would be filed, we'd be done, we'd be over with. And I was kind of hoping the whole thing would be done in maybe about six months or so. Um, the courts had a slightly different opinion, but one thing we did not anticipate um, was what happened with public. So the public, public is a funny thing. Um, as Catherine before me said, uh, sh we also got letters to, they were addressed directly to our homes, but these were letters from convicts in prison. Actual, real, you've been convicted of this horrifying thing, convicts, and three of them were supportive, so that was good. Three of them were not, and that was not good. And one of them, I don't actually know. He put in some kind of weird questionnaire that was, it, it doesn't even make sense to me. Um, so the problem with them, of course, was that they were directly addressed to our home. So they knew where we lived. And that was scary. Um, the blogs, never ever read blog postings. They are. Um, they are dreadful. These were the kind of things that we got on Facebook. I have no problem face shaming people. She was kind enough to put her name on it, so I'm kind enough to put her name on it too. Um, but this is one of a score. Uh, a score is only 20. A lot more than a score of folks that were not happy that we were doing this in their state, because of course it's not really ours, it's theirs. Um, there were blog posts to take us out to the border, shoot us and throw us over into the Oklahoma side. There was somebody ought to get a rifle and do something about them Plano boys. There was, well, you know, a couple of days in the dark could fix this. There were a lot of really, really scary things. And, and it scared the crap out of us. It really did. Um, we we increased the security around our house. Uh, we have three dogs. We rescue beagles. And I was scared to death that somebody would throw poison meat over the fence. Um, I, I had cameras set up. I, I brought in ADT and got everything so that it, at least I would find out who did it, um, even if I couldn't fix it. But um, people would knock on the door and then walk away or run away. Um, and then we had just the nightmares. Mark was just plagued with them. Um, I, I would stop him in the middle of his sleep just to wake him up so that he would just stop screaming. Um, whenever the doorbell went off, uh, the dog certainly went crazy, but we did too. We're like, okay, who is it? Don't look, don't go to the door, look to the side. And of course, we were worried about our dogs. 
on so many different levels. So for all these little panthers hiding in the dark out there, and we took this when we were in Africa, so there's no copyright there. Um, and for all of our little leopards in the dark, um, one thing that we did discover about the people, though, because that paints a pretty bleak picture of humanity, if that's all we have. If the best we have is people who threaten people in the dark, then why are we even here? But the other side of that was so much more uplifting, and it's actually the reason why we kept going. All of you are the reason that we kept going. And that was because for every one horrible person, for every Trish Garcia or whatever her name was, that posted something horrible, there were 10, 12, 20, 100 people who would post and blog under that. What's wrong with you? This, come to this century. Stop living in the past. Get a life. Basically, they were standing up for the idea that we were standing up for. And that gave us heart. That gave us really the courage to keep going. So if we're not for you all helping us to understand that there's more to humanity than those people, we couldn't have done it. So the timeline for this was pretty, it's a short timeline really, when you think about it. Marriage equality wasn't something that happened, you know, it took certainly decades to get there. A lot of people building on everybody's shoulders, but at the end it just went and took off. And my personal opinion is the reason that it took off and took to the speed that it did was because no one was really paying attention to how much injustice was being served there until suddenly there was a focus on how many people, how many actual human people, lives, were being impacted by these decisions, were being impacted by the discrimination that was being propagated. Once people understood that those were real people that were being affected, then just like those angels in the dark that came out against Tish Garcia and her friends, those people rose up too and said, wait, this is not fair. This is not right. And that is why public opinion began to change. Not because it wasn't uh, angled towards fairness before, but because now people recognize that, wait a minute, it isn't fair and I need to say something about that. It is true that in Texas, in 2004-2005, a constitutional amendment to the Texas Constitution was passed that made it so that one man, one woman equals marriage and nothing else. And that Texas amendment, or that amendment to the Constitution was passed by a majority of the voters in that session. But I will also tell you that only 14% of the state voted in that election. So while it's true that 74% of the voters approved of that particular amendment, it was only 14% of an entire state that actually voted, so 74% of 14, which is an incredibly small number. When the rest of the numbers start rising up, that is when cha things begin to change. So we went through quite a bit. Um, over the course of the days, once we filed the lawsuit, it just, it, it hit a, a stumbling block. The stumbling block was the courts, uh, specifically the Fifth Circuit. We actually got through the federal court like that. Judge Garcia had his ruling within two weeks and it was done. And that followed suit with just about every other suit that had been raised throughout the country on the subject. So that was, that was in keeping with the way things were. But when it got to the Fifth Circuit, not so much. When it got to the Fifth Circuit, the Fifth Circuit went, yeah. So rather than the usual maybe two to three months that it would take to get through the cert process and to the hearing process, one year later, that is when we actually got our hearing. So our case was heard here in January, 15, uh, January of 2015, but our case was heard a couple of days after and it's up there like that for a reason. A couple of days after the SCOTUS announcement that they would accept cert for the Obergefell decision. So a year after we had gained the ability to be heard at the Fifth Circuit, 
they actually heard our arguments. From the time that someone hears an argument, uh, the circuit court hears an argument to the time that they render a decision, is typically about three to five months, somewhere in there. They had promised something sooner, but never materialized, not once. Nothing came out of them at all. And as Dave said, I also have an impression that because it was an election season, because our attorney general was Greg Abbott, who was also running for governor at the time, who was also at this point working on this suit, yes, I'm sure that those are just coincidental. So that's kind of why we did it. <clears throat> We did it because it needed to be done, certainly. We did it because where we came from, where we, my parents really made a point of drilling into me that you, you always stand up for the people who can't stand up for themselves. And having gone through what I did, Mark having gone through what he did, there are so many people out there who could not stand up for themselves. And ultimately that was what drove our decision to do this because everybody should have the happily ever after. It shouldn't be denied to anybody. It should be one of those things where everybody gets to travel that road together. And this was us. Be believe it or not, this was at the Supreme Court and there's a whole story in the, in the book about what happened there. The emotion, uh, Dave does a great job of explaining, but in this picture, whenever I see this, the thing that I remember the most is that Mark was taken away from me at the Supreme Court, and this is when I got him back, and I will never let him go. We're going to leave the exact story about how they got separated as a mystery to drive you to read the book. Let me just say it, it involved a right-wing Christian organization. When Mark and Vic uh, asked me to write the book, I was flattered. Um, it was a, a vote of confidence uh, in me from a former student, and nothing is better than that. Uh, but the fact is, like most straight guys, I didn't know a whole lot about the history of LGBT rights. Some of the high points, of course. Uh, I knew the names of the major legal decisions that had led to uh, developing rights for the LGBT community, but not much more than that. I had to start working very, very quickly. And, you know, pretty soon I had as much material as I needed and way, 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 way more. As the book began to take shape in my head, I knew that I wanted to go beyond a chronicle of life events. Mark had sent me a spreadsheet with the facts for Vicks and his life that when printed out ran to 65 pages. And I read it, and I reread it, and I reread it, and I absorbed it. Uh, but it wasn't enough because it was just the facts, ma'am. Just the facts. I knew that I wanted to get beyond that kind of, you know, metronome, clicking from side to side, fact, fact, event, event, uh, and get into something that would be much more character driven. I wanted to get something, a book that would, that would lay bare the humanity of the two men that I was writing about. Uh, I wanted to involve the reader in their struggle. I wanted not just to record what had happened, not even to make people understand what had happened, but I wanted to make people feel Mark and Vic's experience. And ultimately, you know, having felt what happened, to empathize with them and be moved to action. Mark and Vic are the accidental activists, but my hope is that people reading this book will themselves emer emerge into uh, activists themselves. I love the subtitle here of the symposium this year. What does it take to be an agent of change? And I think what it takes is the mind leading the heart and then the heart leaping to action, uh, ultimately. 
within a very short time, a month, two months, I had way too much material. Uh, what had originally uh, been conceived of as a book of about 225 pages was clearly growing. The writer's problem, of course, is dealing, uh, deciding what to include, right? You, you always want to have much more material than you can possibly use. What do you use, though? What do you set aside? But I think, you know, even though we make rational decisions about that when we're writing, there's another component to writing. You know, a, a book isn't just words on a page. It's, it's a living, breathing, organic thing, ultimately. It's natural for a writer to want to shape his or her work, um, but the story is going to find its own way in, in, the, in the final uh, analysis. It's a bit like shaping a bonsai tree, you know? Um, you apply a little pressure here, you know, uh, you let a branch grow over there, you do a bit of shaping over here, but in the end you stand aside and let nature take its, take its course. In the end, the principle of organization or principle of selection for accidental activists uh, that showed me how to shape the book and how to tell Mark and Vic's story in what I hope is an effective way. Working my way through successive drafts, I came to realize, looking at their lives from the time that they were aware that they were gay, for Mark as early as six years old, I began to realize how thoroughly they had been schooled by straight society. How they had been constantly bombarded with messages in their formative years that being gay is wrong, that it would ruin, it would destroy their lives in this world, that they'd burn in hell in the next world, that being gay was dangerous, uh, even life-threatening. and. Getting to know them better and better, I came to realize that by some miracle, some combination of character and luck, they had survived the soul-crushing weight of homophobia in America and even thrived. Look for moments, I told myself, in their lives when the dominant culture spoke, shouted its condemnatory message at boys growing into men, and then look for their life-affirming reaction. Accidental activists would, I determined, focus on the thousand human reasons why Mark and Vic became reluctant rebels, accidental rather than intentional activists. It would tell the story of their lawsuit against Texas, but it would set the lawsuit in the context of the larger, longer struggle for gay rights that caused them and so many others so much pain over the years. It would keep them at the center of the narrative, reacting to this, affected emotionally by that, buoyed by one event, brought low by another. It would be their story, a sampling of the thousand not-so-natural shocks that they experienced growing up, insults and indignities that revealed a hostile landscape and taught them to scan the horizon in search of cultural signs. What would be tolerated? What would be punished? Their story, but as one early reviewer put it, the universe in a grain of sand, an incredible detailed humane account of one couple's activism for same-sex marriage. Now, I can't tell you everything, obviously, in, in a few minutes that, that got rolled into the book. I thought this morning I'd talk a little bit about governmental actions, uh, because it's our government, and presumably speaks for us, right? Uh, but at times, I hope it doesn't, you know. The ways in which the government of the United States harassed and threatened Mark and Vic and millions of others in the LGBT community play an important role in accidental activists. Mark was a young attorney back in 1986 when the Supreme Court decided Bowers v. Hardwick, upholding a Georgia statute that restricted private sexual behavior between consenting adults of the same sex. He was stunned by the angry ch tone of Chief Justice Berger's concurring opinion stressing, and I'm quoting here, the very ancient roots of what he clearly felt to be justifiable animus 
against homosexuals by Berger's citation of William Blackstone's 18th century condemnation, condemnation of sodomy as the infamous crime against nature, an offense of the deepest malignity, uh, deeper malignity than rape, a heinous act, the very mention of which is a disgrace to human nature and a crime not fit to be named. Mark got into a conversation with other attorneys at the firm where he started working, had just started working, all of whom approved of the way the case had been decided. And he quickly realized that for a young man hoping to make a career in the law, being gay would dead end his career in a minute if he were discovered. Now the irony is that in retirement, Justice Lewis Powell Jr., the swing vote in Bowers, admitted that he had voted the wrong way. He admitted that the dissents had had the better of the argument. In, 19, in 2003, Bowers would be reversed by another landmark case, Lawrence v. Texas, uh, that went to the Supreme Court. But in 1986, the message conveyed to gays and lesbians by Bowers v. Hardwick was clear and painful. We have laws against sodomy, the decision said. We may not often enforce those laws. We don't have to. The reason they remain on the books is to justify discrimination and animus. Be shamed. Be silent. Most of all, understand every day of your lives that you are a member of a despised minority. Ten years later, 1996, the, as the possibility of same-sex marriage being legalized in Hawaii became to seem very real, Mark and Vic watched as conservatives rushed the so-called Defense of Marriage Act through Congress with veto-proof majorities in both houses. There was no way President Clinton could stop this bill. Section 2 ensured that the states would not be required to recognize same-sex marriages legally contracted in other places. Section 3 defined marriage as only a legal union between one man and one woman, punishing same-sex couples by denying them benefits promised in 1,049 federal statutes. The report of the House Judiciary Committee filled with ominous passages that evoked images of threats and war and destruction, it, it's like a poem that's gone bad, made clear the extent of anti-gay animus behind DOMA. In time, it too would be reversed. The result of a landmark decision by the Supreme Court in 2013 United States versus Windsor. And of course, most of you probably know that we lost Edie Windsor just last week. But in the intervening years, the message, a collective moral judgment relegating gays and lesbians to the outer darkness, was painfully clear. Don't ask, don't tell. President Bill Clinton's 1993 compromise allowing gays and lesbians to serve in the military was yet another policy that, given Vic's nearly 23 years of service in the Air Force, ensured that he and Mark would almost daily come face to face with their status as moral outsiders whose presence would be tolerated only if they remain in the shadows, um, denied who they were, surrendered their selves, and in so doing, denied the human need for integrity and authenticity. Conceived as a protection for gays and lesbians in the military, it had the opposite effect. Between 1993 and 1994, the first year that policy went into effect, discharges for conduct unbecoming, as it was known, rose 124 percent. They didn't go down, they went up. They peaked in 2001 when 1,073 gays and lesbians had their military careers cut short in just that one year. And the witch hunts involved in all of that sent a wave of paranoia through the LGBT community. The same sad message. 
though he never took a course in existential philosophy, or at least he hasn't admitted it to me, Vic understood full well what such a culture of repression does to people held down. At some point, it didn't matter to me, Vic told me one day. If don't ask, don't tell got repealed. The policy wasn't the real problem. The real problem was that don't ask, don't tell existed in the first place because we weren't real people. If we had been real people from the start, don't ask, don't tell would never have been. Of course, as Vic explained, don't ask, don't tell uh, was repealed just as he was leaving the Air Force. Um, but still, the damage was done. He and Vic had to li uh, he and Mark had to live with it uh, for so much of their time together. Anti-gay policies enacted by Congress, anti-gay judgments issued by the Supreme Court, cultural signs signaling they were a part of a marginalized community caused Mark and Vic great pain. But the policies and judgments had real-world consequences, too. As Justice Kennedy observed in Lawrence v. Texas in 2003, when homosexual conduct is made criminal by the law of the, st of the state, that declaration in and of itself is an invitation to subject homosexual persons to discrimination in both the public and in the private spheres. Sadly, the late Justice Antonin Scalia whose unrelenting opposition to civil rights for gays and lesbians led to a series of splenetic dissents in every gay rights case to come before the court during his tenure, tacitly invited Americans to discriminate against the LGBT community in his 1996 dissent in Romer v. Evans at a time when he began to realize that the conservative forces were losing the fight. Justice Scalia mocked what he called the eminent reasonableness of the majority opinion that dared to include grim, disapproving hints that Coloradans have been guilty of animus towards homosexuality, as though that has been established as un-American. This is the Supreme Court justice now, saying that animus toward members of the LGBT community, that's an American virtue. Not a problem. Comparing homosexual conduct to murder or polygamy or cruelty to animals, Justice Scalia concluded that the only sort of animus at issue in Romer stems from the moral approval of homosexual disapproval of homosexual conduct. And he justified that moral condemnation with a predictable reference to centuries old criminal laws, black to blackstone. The people of Colorado are, Justice Scalia wrote, entitled to be hostile toward homosexual conduct. I'm sure Justice Scalia never thought that people would take that entitlement to the extremes that they would take it to. But the fact is, of course, not everybody is an intellectual like Justice Scalia, and they did. Two years after the Romer decision, Mark and Vic and most Americans looked down in horror as the hostility to which Justice Scalia claimed people morally opposed to homosexuality were entitled found a brutal outlet on a road outside Laramie, Wyoming. Matthew Shepard lashed to a fence post where he had been left to die in the cold, his skull broken his clothing soaked in blood, beaten so badly with a pistol that his brain stem was no longer able to regulate his body temperature. Lurking always in the background for Mark and Vic was the re very real danger, approved of by Justice Scalia, of being beaten, perhaps even beaten to death for being gay. Straight culture's ultimate warning to the LGBT community to keep a low profile. In Texas, Mark could cite the cases of Paul Broussard, beaten to death by 12 thrill-seeking teenagers with fists and boots and nail-studded two-by-fours, even a knife with which he was re 
uh, stabbed repeatedly. And Michael Beneshik, his head smashed by a blunt instrument, his throat slit. For Vic in the Air Force, the psychological terrors of being outed were compounded by the dangers of a testosterone-fueled environment. He knew of the high-profile cases of servicemen being killed. Alan Schindler, stomped to death by a shipmate who sang as blood gushed from his mouth. Barry Winchell, murdered in his sleep by a soldier who smashed his head with a baseball bat. You're gay, Vic imagined, his antagonist asking. That's okay. I can fix that because I can beat it out of you. And if not, I'll just keep going till you're not there. On at least one occasion, it very nearly happened to him. And for years, when Mark drove home from a gay bar, he looked compulsively in the rearview mirror. Most of us are given to empathy. Most human beings can't watch cruelty to animals, cruelty to other people, without feeling some kind of empathy. How can anyone listen to stories like this about what Mark and Vic endured growing up in America and not be moved? Were there but world enough in time, I could add much, much more threats and indignities they endured as children men, some the result of intentional bullying, some simply fall out from a homophobic culture, dangers that loomed as they pursued their suit against Texas, arguments against same-sex marriage so ludicrous that as they sat listening in courtroom after courtroom all the way to the Supreme Court, judges and justices had to ask again and again to the lawyers defending the states, what are you trying to say? It didn't make any sense. Aren't you moved by all of this? Some parts of accidental activists were hard to write because I had to learn a whole lot about the history of gay rights in America and decide which salient moments to include. Some parts were hard to write because in dealing with the legal aspects of Mark and Vic's lawsuit, I had to learn a whole new language. I taught English, not law. I had to learn a whole new way of thinking. The shelves of my study are lined now with rows and rows of books I read to make sure I was getting the story right. Stacked in one corner of my study are four huge file boxes, so heavy that I can barely lift them. News stories, expert analyses, transcripts of interviews I conducted, congressional documents, briefs, motions, court decisions at every level, emails from Mark and Vic, and their lawyers and dozens of people I interview. But honestly, in the end, that kind of hard was easy. In truth, the hardest parts of accidental activists to write, the hardest by far, were those in which, having come to identify in all that matters with Mark and Vic, having come to feel at least some part of the faint pain they felt, I struggled that pain on the stage in a way that would allow readers to share in it as well. It's all about empathy. Close to 25 people read Accidental Activists before it was published. Writer friends looking to help with structure, critics who vetted it for the press, hard-nosed lawyers looking to make sure I had gotten the legal parts right, the director of the UNT Press, my editor there, most confess, even the, even the lawyers, that they read at times with tears in their eyes. I've heard the same thing in emails, in reviews from early readers, seen it in reviews on the internet too. There were moments, I'll confess, when I wrote with tears in my eyes. Other parts of the book are joyous, uplifting. Accidental activists is a civil rights story story about the voyage of the hero, but most of all, it's a love story about two men, head over heels in love, who wanted nothing more than what we all want, the right to marry the person they love most in all the world. Writing about the love that Mark and Vic feel for each other, about the courage they showed in telling their story in one of the most conservative states in America, 
about how they learn to ride the whirlwind, about their ability to weather criticism and to treat today's enemy as tomorrow's friend, about their wedding and the 350 people who gathered to celebrate uh, who they were and all they had done, all that was moving in a different way. At the White House Pride celebration in June 2016, the last reception to take place at the White House, since the current administration seems to have turned against the LGBT community, President Obama paused to reflect on the past and to look to the future. Less than a year had passed since the Supreme Court made marriage equality the law of the land. We live now, he enthused, in an America where the laws are finally catching up to the hearts of kids and what they instinctively understand. But in the midst of the celebration, the president sounded as well a note of warning. Change is possible. Progress is possible, he said. It's not inevitable, however. History doesn't just travel forward. It can go backwards if we don't work hard. Under the Trump administration, we have seen that happen. Though he claimed during his campaign for the presidency that he was a friend of the LGBT community, he chose for the vice presidential slot Governor Mike Pence, the conservative champion who signed and stubbornly defended SB 101, the toxic religious uh, Freedom Restoration Act that shattered Indiana's open for business reputation. Senior staff picks, Steve Bannon, Steve Miller, choices for cabinet positions, Ben Carson, Jeff Sessions, Betsy DeVos. His Supreme Court appointment, Justice Neil Gorsuch, have made his intentions clear. Fearful that America will sink again into the darkness, my mind goes back now to President Obama's remarks at that last White House uh, Pride reception. He reminded the audience that day of Bayard Rustin, the gay civil rights leader who organized the March on Washington at which Martin Luther King delivered his famous I Have a Dream speech. We need in every community, Buster, Bayard Rustin said, a group of angelic troublemakers. We know what's right, but the right end of knowledge lies not in just knowing what is right, but in acting on that knowledge. Unfortunately, the pleasures of the world, little things, big things, sometimes keep us from action. My fondest hope is that you'll read accidental activists, will feel what Mark and Vic felt, will react emotionally and be moved to action. My hope is that you'll sign on as one, of, one more of Bayard Rustin's angelic troublemakers. Maybe become not so accidental activists. In fact, you can kind of forget the angelic part. Thank you. Well, we don't have time for Q&A, unfortunately, but if you have questions, I'm sure that Dave and Vic would be happy to ask them during, answer them during the book signing. Uh, and so would you please join me in thanking Dave and Vic one more time?